You're listening to Health Tech Matters, a podcast brought to you by the Pankhurst Institute at the University of Manchester. I'm your host, Lamise Hassan. Hi, Lamise. I'm really excited to hear about your conversation with Alex Kasson. How did it go? Hey, Vidaya. It went really well. Uh, We talked about Alex's work on wearable sensors, including his work on non-invasive sensors. So think like things like temporary tattoos that can pick up your heart rate. Wow, that sounds really exciting. I mean, I haven't got any tattoos. How does that work? (laughs) Well, you'll have to listen to find out. But one of the cool things about Alex is that not only is he really experienced and has expertise from a technical point of view he's really focused on how these things translate in practice so he's got that wider outlook on how patients and clinicians and healthcare system can really use this technology i think you're going to really enjoy it that sounds really exciting it's one of the challenges that we have around translating new technologies is a lack of understanding of how these things will be used in practice that sounds really really useful exactly and so central to the pankhurst theme brilliant can't wait let's get into it Dr. Alex Casson is a reader in the Department of Electrical and Electronic Engineering at the University of Manchester. His lab focuses on researching non-invasive bioelectronic interfaces, that is, designing and applying sensors for monitoring the human body in everyday life. We're delighted to have Alex join us today on the podcast. Alex, how are you? Uh, It looks like you've been really busy by the looks of it on Twitter, on lecture circuit and getting new toys for your lab. I'm very well, thank you. Yes, um, it is very busy. There's so many opportunities in my research space at the moment that, you know, it's really exciting, but also hard to keep up with all of them. Well, we're delighted you've made time to come and see us today. So let's kick things off. Your work focuses on non-invasive sensors. Can you tell us a little bit about what non-invasive sensors are and how they're different from invasive sensors? So broadly, I would class this as wearable devices. So these are devices that are sitting outside of the body, principally on, on the on the on the skin. Um, when we classify these things, you, you can be kind of on the skin, you can be in a cavity like your mouth, for example, or you can be physically kind of inside the the body. Ninety nine percent of the stuff I do is kind of sitting on the on the skin. So are we thinking things like watches um, or smart rings, those types of devices that you buy off the shelf, or are these slightly different? So we've got quite a wide spectrum of things in my lab. So some of them are wrist-worn devices, so standard kind of wearable type things. Mm-hmm. But we also do a lot kind of not at the at the wrist. So because if you're focusing on the wrist, there are, of course, you know, very, very good commercial devices that you can go and buy. And we've got a number of projects helping clinicians use those kind of off-the-shelf devices. Where we might come in at the more engineering level would be when you need a device for elsewhere. So I've got a lot of work about kind of smart shoes, placing sensors at the feet where they can be kind of completely covered up. You know, you're not aware of that externally with any kind of monitoring going on. But also actually my lab is very well known for our work on brain interfacing. So mm. we spend a lot of time putting electrodes on people's heads for kind of, yeah, wearable, portable brain monitoring. Wow. OK, so the position on the body is quite important depending on the purpose that you have. Yes. So there's a trade-off often between the physiological parameter that you want to measure. So if you want to measure the heart, for example, often you'd put you know electrodes on your on your chest, ideally on either side of the heart. Mm-hmm. But a trade-off between that and say wearability, ease of use. Um, so you know most heart monitoring in wearables is done at the wrist rather than on the on the chest. Yeah, and I can imagine um, you might raise a few eyebrows if you wander around with something on your head, for example. Yes, people do this. Um, if for epilepsy diagnosis is where I kind of started in this sort of area. Um, it is routine for people to have what's called ambulatory EEG. So that's when you put electrodes on your head. They would kind of send you out back you know, into your home environment because you want to try and capture stimuli, which you don't necessarily have in a clinical environment, something that might be a causative factor in triggering um, your epilepsy and similar but, you know, this was kind of 15 or more years ago, speaking to users, patients, they would often have stories of people pointing, looking, being upset by this because, you know, you've got this big bulky instrumentation on your on your head. And that was always the aim, the starting aim, you know, to decrease some of that, make it more 
socially acceptable. Mm, indeed, to try and make it more discreet. I think um, a few years ago I did some work looking at wearable devices amongst people living with dementia and that kind of unobtrusive and being discreet factor was one of their most overriding preferences for any kind of technology that they'd use. So I can understand that. Can I ask you about when I was doing some research on you ahead of this interview, I noticed you also have an interest in skin conformable, flexible sensors. Could you describe what they are? So I would describe these as the next step beyond kind of current wearable devices. So one way of looking at current wearables is that they're the next, they're, they're the current step in the miniaturization of electronics. So in the kind of 1980s, we had kind of desktop PCs emerging, um, you know, those kind of big tower block things. Mm-hmm. In the 1990s, you start to get laptops um, becoming becoming popular. In the 20, in the 2000s, so it was smartphones. And then in the 2010s, it's that's when you get to see smart watches. And it's really the same sort of electronics miniaturized down each time. These kind of conformal tattoo type things are a step beyond that, miniaturizing everything down again to the point where they can be flexible and they can be stretchable. So rather than mm. sitting, say, on top of your wrist with a band holding them on, they can stick directly to the, to the skin, follow the micro contours of your skin so they get a very good contact you can get very good quality signals um coming coming out from them they're very socially discreet they're very comfortable to wear wow and what kind of things can they measure are they just as capable as regular electronic devices um i'm not sure capable is necessarily the right word at this point because they are still a research um project being evolved you, you can't really buy these things commercially yet and so some of the things you see in the research literature might be a bit different by the time they've got more protection on them to actually be sold you know they've got to have some casing or or, or, or whatnot um, but in terms of parameters broadly at the moment we're looking at the same sort of things so in my prototype devices um, we're measuring things like activity and heart rate so those are very standard modalities you could get in um, an off-the-self device at the moment. But the idea is that that becomes our base platform. And then we can start to swap in, swap out other stuff. So we're doing a lot of work at the moment looking at adding in what I would call wet modalities. Mm. So um, adding in some microfluidics for collecting sweat and then analysing that for things like lactate, P8s. We're just starting a project looking at if we can do cortisol sensing for stress on that sort of a, a flexible platform. But also, um, not just on the healthcare side, looking at swapping out some of the components that we're using for sustainability purposes. So at the moment, we make these on a plastic substrate mm-hmm. and looking to swap that out for uh, more biodegradable substrate. So some of our demonstrator devices probably wouldn't use these in the real world, but demonstrators, we just use a bit of paper, for example, and really trying to get more sustainable kind of net zero type electronics. Well, that's really interesting that sustainability has entered that conversation, even level of of these types of devices. With these types of, you'd call them tattoos as such, is there a kind of shelf life on them? Because one of the one of the key challenges, I guess, and you'll know way more about this than I will, is battery power amongst wearable sensors. So how long do they last? I'm assuming when you say tattoo, you're not actually tattooing someone. Um, so, yes, when we say tattoo, we, we shouldn't use that word. We should always try and say temporary tattoo. Yeah. There are groups out there looking at kind of conductive inks for real tattoos, as it were. But that's not what, what I'd be looking at. Where I started in this area was actually looking at the kind of rub-on tattoos that you have as children's toys. Mm-hmm. And you can buy those at home to put through your printer and you can print a nice picture onto them. What we would look to do is, is the same thing, but um, put some electronic circuits and functionality onto um, that sort of, a, sort, sort of a platform. So it is very much a temporary tattoo rather than a, um, a, 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 a real tattoo. Now, there are questions there about the reusability, and it's something that, from the engineering point of view, we struggle with quite quite a bit, because we could get a much better system if we were willing for it to be disposable. Hmm. Um, But, of course, that's got sustainability, it's got cost impact and and, and whatnot. 
In terms of direct power consumption, so, I mean, battery life is something that comes up again and again, and when we get feedback from clinical colleagues, it's often battery life that they will highlight for us. But this is where we tension off a little bit in my lab some of the more translational focused work from some of the lower technology readiness level work where it's going to take a long time to get into the clinic. So it's not me working on it directly, but in one of my projects, a collaborator is working at printing the battery at the same time as the electronics. So we've not just got kind of flexible electronics, we've got a flexible, stretchable battery that is made at the same time. Now, it's going to take us some time to get that into the translational um, pipeline, but we're really trying to tick all of those, those different boxes. This podcast is brought to you by the Christopher Pankis Institute at the University of Manchester. At the Institute, we explore solutions to healthcare challenges by translating research into practice. We love to collaborate, so if you have an idea or would like to come on the podcast, please get in touch. I really want to pick up on that point about this pipeline. Lots of our listeners might have might be familiar with something like the Topol Review, um, which has looked at the future of digital technologies in the NHS. And that seemed to predict that wearable sensors are going to become a part of, I think they quote, 80% of patient pathways for long-term conditions by 2040, which doesn't feel that long off, <laughs> given all these challenges. How likely do you think that future vision is and where do you think the challenges lie in achieving that? Um, I, I think in terms of achieving it, I might put it as a medium level of success or, or risk, whichever way you want to uh, you, you, you want to look at it. I mean, I think in some ways it's very credible, right? We mm-hmm. can buy lots of different devices. I can see you're wearing a Whoop right now. You know, we can go out and do that tomorrow, as it were, if we wanted to. On the other hand, of course, there are lots of challenges there. So not least about um, the healthcare inequalities and who's going to pay for buying kind of whoops or whatnot. You know, is it going to be that you get better quality data if I can afford to buy an Apple Watch? And other some, devices are available. Yeah, and, well, and, and somebody else <laughs> buys a different one. I don't, I don't know. Um, but there's lots of different um, kind of, yeah, access and equality type questions. But then also, of course, there's about the data flows. Um, and are the, is the data actually feeding in to some care pathway, some dashboard that a clinician can see, or is it just sitting outside on, let's use Fitbit this time, on their servers? Mm. So it's way more complicated than just the, the hardware, the engineering side. It's also bringing together the data science and then thinking about the patient pathways and bringing all of that together. I think that's the key challenge in terms of fundamentally getting them impacting 80% of, of care pathways. Mm. And then beyond that, there is the, you know, the long-standing question around accuracy. Um, and you know, no sensor is perfect. Um, and you know, the classical clinical saying would be that you, know, you should never rely on one piece of evidence. You know, it's about building up a picture and the balance of probability to get about all of the info that you have available to you. But if you're using, say, a wearable device, right, the aim is to get data from where you couldn't get it before. So that might well be the only data source that you have. Um, And, you know, if you've got kind of, say, error bars on how accurate the activity count is and how accurate the heart rate is, then, you know, we need the care pathway to be robust to those. Mm. But it seems compelling case that rather than asking someone a question such as, you know, how much moderate to vigorous activity do you do a week? It seems silly to me in this day and age, we have to rely on people to self-report and assess those different types of activity levels, sleep levels, um, when you have devices that would do that way more accurately. I would really struggle to classify that myself. Uh, So it seems like there's lots of use cases out there where we could really make a difference and do that monitoring outside the clinic. You do have to differentiate between the psychology and the physiology. And this is a question that comes up to me quite a bit. So what your wearables are measuring is the physiology. Right? It's measuring your heart rate, your, your, your step count or whatnot. But, you know, a high level of activity may be very different for you than it is for me. It might be very different for me. I'm, I've, I've hurt my foot. So I'm really doing very little exercise at the moment. So a lot of, ex, uh, you know, a high level of activity for me right now is different to what it would have been six months ago when I was, you know, training for the Manchester Marathon. Um, and it's very hard to capture that purely with sensor data. 
And I think I would always be keen to say, you know, wearables are one part of that kind of 80% of care pathway um, picture, but they're not a does everything single, single shot. Um, I mean, there's um, questions about some of the tensions behind wearable devices. So to some people, you know, being able to monitor you out of the clinic, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, we don't have to bring you in and whatnot. That's really enabling. It means you don't need to travel across town or, or whatnot. To other people, it's throwing you out the door saying, come back, you know, when you're, when you're really at death's door and it's really disengaging from the system. Yeah, and that's a common concern, isn't it, with technology, that by introducing technology, we might lose the advantage of that face-to-face -face element of interacting with healthcare professionals. Yeah, ab ab absolutely. And it, it's, I guess it comes down to responsible innovation and using this to improve things rather than purely as a cost-saving or you know, getting people out the door sort of thing. Of course, of course. Hmm. So it's clear from what you've been talking about, it's not just, it's not only the kind of technical aspects that you've been considering. There's a lot to consider about patient preferences and how this works in, in real life. Can you tell me a little bit about how you work with patients, clinicians, the NHS, uh, to try and make sure that your work is addressing real needs? What do you do? How do you do it? And, and how does that help what you do? Well, to, to answer the last bit first, um, I mean, I just think it's got to be this kind of co-design concept has got to be core. You know, we're not aiming to do pure technology push where stuff goes out the door and it's us saying what it ought to look like. There are lots of different um, stakeholders um, and it's just the way you need to do it. Um, in terms of how I do it in, in my lab, I think there's a few different answers to that question. So firstly, what I would highlight is we're trying to do it systemically. So it's not a, I'm an engineer and I think we ought to do some co-design. Right? So as you said at the start, I've got an appointment in the medical school. I've got an appointment in the NHS, in the Clinical Engineering Group um, in, in Northern Care Alliance. And it's about, you know, kind of being embedded in those um, environments. So... We had um, Steve, one of my um, MD students, visiting us, you know, and he was doing some work with one of my engineering students. Um, and we want to call that Tuesday. You know, that's not Lee mm -hmm. <laughs> having a special one-off meeting with uh, a clinical person to say what it ought to, ought to, ought to, ought to look like. Um, then secondly, within my work, what I'd say very much is we have a portfolio, right? And it's quite broad. It's maybe too broad, but um, it's, it's a broad portfolio. And what we're looking to do is leverage that to help the other bits so we've got some bits um say you know, we lose some of the printed batteries that's a very long way from kind of patient benefit at the same time you know we're learning lessons from how do patients actually interact with devices when do they work when do they fail from some of the higher trl stuff um and we can use that to inform the other projects and vice versa of course so because with the higher technology readiness level ones we're aware of what's coming kind of downstream from the from the the, the the research literature and then beyond that you get into your more classical um kind of co-design um events you know very regular meetings with different stakeholders and of course there are a lot you know so it's not just patients it's not just clinicians it's not just research governance it's not just um um entrepreneurs what's, what's the phrase investors i think <laughs> um it's a real ecosystem and i would very much try and use the phrase co-design because it's very hard to satisfy all of those groups at the same time sometimes we are clinical um clinical pool sometimes we're patient pool sometimes we're technology puss and you know we want to have the confidence to say this project is like this and you might want it to be patient pool but it's clinical pool because they the clinicians say they need this so does, does that make sense yeah so i can see from what you're talking it's having having that ability to zoom in as well as zoom out see the big picture but focus on some of these as well as focusing on some of these more technical challenges but also bringing in that ecosystem of stakeholders i wonder what you think you've you've worked in london before you came to manchester um so i'm interested do you think about the Manchester environment, is there something about Manchester that's ripe for this type of change? It seems to me that we do have quite a healthy ecosystem of 
interested clinicians, data scientists, um, people interested in engineering, innovators in the Northwest? Or is that pretty normal? Um, I, 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 I mean, I would still look at Envy in it to be the London and maybe, um, and maybe a few other kind of kind of places because I think they've got some kind of critical mass in the, you know, just being a bigger place. So, you know, you've got the, the stuff at Francis Crick and you've got the stuff at UCL and you've got the stuff at King's, all of whom are strong in their own right. Um, now, that said, I mean, Manchester has a fantastic ecosystem um, and, you know, that's been recognised, you know, with, with levelling up and some of the um, investments we are an, an innovation accelerator zone, I think that's the correct term, for digital health and advanced materials, which is me, right? That's <laughs> what my lab does. We, we span those two, those two bits between like the Voice Institute and the Turing Institute. Um, there's a fantastic ecosystem of clinicians. Let's say there's some, uh, a good group and again, a critical mass of people, of clinicians who are engaged in research, who want to, to do stuff. I would be particularly complimentary of Northern Care Alliance I think they've really got there with, with with Natalie and all. They've really got their head screwed on, if I can use that term, of where they want to go in terms of innovation, in terms of embedding research into the into the the, the journey. We've got they're not online yet, but 1.5 billion is going into regenerating the previous North Campus to make it into a the IQ Science Park. Uh, that'll be a, a few years years away. I think what we just need is more time money and people you know we, we yeah we want to get more more critical mass going in this space great okay so exciting times ahead um i also think some of the benefits of working in a smaller environment is perhaps the opportunity to understand the networks around you and to know and to know those familiar faces well i was speaking at a conference just over coffee to somebody recently at a much smaller university than, than we are when he was, you know, contemplating jumping ship, as it were, to a, a bigger fist. But, I mean, my advice to him it was that you want to be somewhere that works. You know, it's much better to have that, um, that network that facilitates things, that can get things done, rather than being a small fist in a big pond, as it were. Mm. Right, lastly, before we sign off, I'm just ask you, what have you got coming up that you're excited about? Or is there anything about your future plans that you want to highlight? Um, um, it, I, I mean, in terms of research, um, I mean, I'm so excited about loads and loads and loads of stuff. Um, it's a really exciting time to be in this area. Um, I think I would highlight for you to just one. So a project that we've just started, which is about wearables for carers. Um, and I'm really excited about this because it comes up again and again right that we you know we we tend to focus on the patient rather than on the people around them and the other carer is usually a really important part of that of that, of that picture and it comes up again in that you know we don't have necessarily have wearable devices for them um, but it's very difficult to do that sort of project because what does a wearable device look like for a carer but it probably looks exactly the same as one for a patient in terms of, well, what are you going to measure? You can measure heart rate, you can measure step count and, 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 and whatnot. And I think that's made it quite difficult to fund in the past because from a technical point of view, the wearable might be extremely similar. Mm. But now we've got some funding to sit down with carers. So these are going to be people looking after somebody who's just post ICU discharge. And firstly, just understand, you know, how could wearables help support you? Um, what sort of things would be important for you to, to, to feedback and, and, you know, build a support network and all, all of that sort of, sort of thing? And I think it's a really important and previously hard to do area. So I'm very, very excited about that. That sounds really exciting. I think we really rely on on carers to allow people to be discharged from hospital, to look after them when they're home, and yet often their health needs, mental and physical, are completely overlooked. So it's a really interesting area. Well, Alex, um, that's all the time we've got today. Thank you so much for joining us, and we look forward to seeing what stellar things you do in future. Cool. Thank you very much.
If you've enjoyed listening to this podcast, then tell your friends and colleagues. And don't forget to hit follow so you don't miss future episodes.